This is the last in a series of five panels charting the 50 years of Art Basel. Um, this week, we're taking a relatively short journey back into the 2010s. Um, last week, we spoke with a lot of people who were involved with the launch of Art Basel Miami Beach in 2001, 2002. Um, this year, what we're looking at is the launch of Art Basel Hong Kong. And, and unlike Art Basel Miami Beach, Art Basel Hong Kong was launched uh, in succession or sort of on the on the foundation that was built by a previous fair called RHK. I have a very strong memory because this was something I was very much involved in of coming to Hong Kong in 2010 and arriving at night and throwing open the blinds um, in the hotel where I was, the the Hyatt and, and the Grand Hyatt and looking at the harbor and looking at the exhibition center below and saying, suddenly having this enormous sense of possibility. And, and pretty quickly, Art Basel and MCH, our parent company, started the negotiation to buy into first part of and then all of Art HK and then transform it over the course of two years into Art Basel Hong Kong. Um, this was an enormous journey and a very interesting one, um, particularly because as I came to learn, um, Asia really of all the continents within the art world is the most complex, the most multifaceted, the most heterogeneous set of countries. You know, you have so many language groups, so many religious beliefs, so many colonial, colonialist, colonialist histories, um, so many different influences. And this, the, the, the geography is enormous. Um, so, you know, in comparison to what we've done in the past, Asia was an enormous challenge, but it was also an enormous opportunity um, and Hong Kong was really the right place to do it. You know, it was not only the financial capital of Asia, but it's also geographically perfectly positioned. It's a great city, you know, for people who haven't traveled a lot in Asia, who only speak English um, in terms of getting around. Um, the tax and, and legal parameters are perfect. Um, and most importantly, perhaps for us, you know, we were, we were at the beginning of and then helped to spur a real um, gallery scene within within the city, which is much larger than the gallery scenes that we have either in Basel or in Miami. So it added a completely different dimension to the fair, especially as that as you know as we and the gallery scene grew together. Um, it was also a place where we were able to launch a, an amazing project with BMW, the BMW Art Journey. Um, and fittingly enough, the first winner was Samson Young, who at the time was a, a relatively unknown artist, a musicologist by training, um, who launched an amazing project as part of the first Art Basel BMW art journey, um, and then went on to work appropriately enough with some of the great galleries who had come from other parts of the world to be part of the Art Basel Hong Kong show. Um, uh, likewise, um, you know, Lili Chan, you know, similarly from the region, you know, just won the, uh, the Art Journey Prize and has gone on, has started her journey as well. So it was a, it was a place where we started a lot of really interesting projects over the years. Um, I'm joined by three representative august members of the Asian art world. Um, I'll go, uh, I'll start with um, Emmy Wu, uh, who from joining us from Singapore. Um, Emmy, if you could say hi. Elaine Eng, joining us from Hong Kong and Taka Yuka Ishii, better known as Taka, um, from joining us from, from his gallery in Tokyo. Um, I'm going to start with Taka um, in terms of my questions. Taka, you're pretty singular among Japanese gallerists in the sense that, you know, working from what's thought of as a relatively insular country, you've, were, you were act, very active internationally, both in terms of the artists that you had and in terms of, you know, for the fact that you actually set up a gallery in LA for a while. Um, you joined Art Basel as a gallerist relatively early, both in Basel and then I think later in Miami for a while. Um, and I'm curious, you know, when you think about how the international audience grew, um, both the audience for international art in Japan and in Asia, but also the audience for internet for for Asian artists at a global level. How do you see this, this progression over the time, over your time as a gallerist? So maybe you can say a little bit about how the gallery started, just to give people some context. Yes. 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 I started in, in 1994 
in Tokyo. And in 1997, I opened a gallery in Busan, but only a few, maybe two years. And we uh, decided not to uh, do that anymore. Then participate in art fairs starting on 1997, I think. Then we joined the Art Basel, I think, I don't remember exactly, but 10 years ago in Basel, I think. I think, yeah. And the spread of the internet and the arrival of information based on society in 1990s made information about art instantly accessible and the exchange of images and video much easier significantly alternating the way we work in the art world. That is 25 years ago, we had a big box size computer, but I had no internet access at the time. The communication tool was the, just a fax machine. The, every morning I got, to, I got to see like five meter fax paper coming out from uh, the fax machine. Hmm. Most be the handwriting, so very difficult to read, especially from the important clients. Written letter would be like a crisp, 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 crisp. Yeah, cryptography. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The sending the images in another thing. We used to send. Uh, we used to send and receive images of the works or by post or FedEx like a color positive because of the accuracy of the color, I think. The taking a photo, sending a film to lab is waiting for a few days, then making a label and each transparency, transparency to finally send it by FedEx. And timing was flowing more slowly at the time. A few days ago, I, <clears throat> I got a text from uh, one of my clients in Japan. He saw starting ruby paintings on Instagram and expressed interest. So we asked Starry for availability and he emailed back to us on the same day saying he was available. And I text my client about the availability and he described to purchase the work. This all happened only in a few hours. It's amazing, I think. And yeah, it's the notion that art and design elements are important to uh, business has also uh, spread. The recently, for example, the book uh, called is a Japanese book. The why do the uh, global elite on their aesthetic sensibility has become a bestseller here in Japan. At first, I scuffled at the book, but once I started, I couldn't put it down. And here's a pretty good passage from it. Uh, let me see. Uh, our diary work will have an accumulative effect and shape the world in 100 and 200 years. In this sense, we are all artists who are making a social, social sculpture, as such as Joseph Boy's arguments that we should socialize with self-consciousness and aesthetic sensibility should be heeded, heeded especially in those troubled times. Indeed, we should. Yeah. So I couldn't hear. Sorry. Talk, I was saying. Oh, go ahead. I missed it. Sorry. I missed yeah. the voice. That's fine. I know it was my fault completely. Um, <laughs> the Zoom effect. Uh, no, I mean, I, I have one question, which is that you were, you're, you're among other things, you're, you're really one of the great photography galleries um, of the region and of the world. And I'm curious, I mean, nowadays, people think of artists like Nobuyushi Araki or Daido Maruyama as sort of accepted figures in the photography world. 
But at the time that you started in, you know, uh, 26 years ago, mm -hmm. did you have to, was it already accepted or was it something you really had to teach the Western collectors to appreciate? Yes, the, especially the street photographer in Japan was not uh, the well known in outside of Japan. Mm -hmm. So we started uh, taking the uh, uh, photographies to the fairs. And first we show um, Araki and Daido in the, uh, the, uh, the, I think, Chateau Mamont Fair mm -hmm. in 87, I think. Then it was very uh, well uh, expect, expected. And Good. people loved that. Then we, we saw a lot of um, uh, lucky and title works. Right. And since then, lots of uh, uh, curator came and asking about uh, uh, the shows and also the uh, they wanted to put it in the uh, uh, international festivals of songs. Great. Thank you, Taka. I'm going to go from now from Tokyo to Singapore um, to Emmy. Uh, Emmy has, has, is not only the executive director of STPI, which is a, a Singaporean based creative workshop, and contemporary art gallery, and obviously one of the leading workshops for, for artist editions. Um, but she's also a founding selection committee member for Art Basel Hong Kong, which means that Emmy and I have spent a lot of time in convention center meeting rooms and hotel meeting rooms, um, trying to figure out what the next fair should be working closely with Adeline Oye, who's our director of Asia and the rest of the committee members. So uh, in addition to which she's been on our joint committee, which deals with some of the biggest issues uh, across all of the fairs. So I think Emmy's had a lot of different ways of looking at this. Um, but what's interesting, I think, to take a step back uh, to when we came to Asia is that at the time, um, and Emmy, correct me, you know, to whatever extent I'm wrong, but at the time, art fairs were not a big part of the, of the Asian art market. You know, they were not, there were, there were no really major international fairs in the region. Um, and yet, you know, I think they went from being smaller events to regional events to truly having an international dimension. And I think had a real impact on the shape of the market within Asia. So I'm curious, Emmy, as someone who's not only been a participant in fairs and launched a, a fair of a fair or a fair like event with Southeast, um, the Southeast Asia, the SIA focus event, but also been an, an integral part of helping us to form our fairs. What is the, what is the role of fairs? What, what is the role of fairs in Asia now compared to what it was? Well, um, I think Elaine would agree that between Hong Kong and Singapore, there had been fairs, not necessarily art fairs, but fairs that dealt with, I think, primarily jewelry and, and what we call fine art um, that deals with other types of art. But if we talk about contemporary art fairs, I think it is with the Art Basel and not Art Basel, Art Hong Kong, Art HK, the predecessor to Art Basel Hong Kong that really kind of put some attention on contemporary art event in our region. Um, I still remember when Magnus was part of Art HK and then I, I got involved also on the selection committee there that um, it kind of took off very slowly, but within I think few years it garnered a lot of attention. So um, with that and then to transition of Art Basel Hong Kong, but on our side of the region, Southeast Asia, we had something called um, Art Stage, if you remember, that is a predecessor to see focus. So I think in the last uh, probably 10 to 12 years, the, the art fairs, the contemporary art fairs really played a big part. And until then, I do think that there, there were collectors going to different art fairs. And of course we cannot ignore the art fairs in Korea, Kia, for example, that was organized by the gallery and the Taipei art fair was also there organized by the Art Gallery Association. So there were smaller fairs but they, until the, I guess in the last eight years, we, we saw this very um, much bigger presence of art fair 
in on the contemporary arts industry with with the um, Art Basel Hong Kong. Would you agree, Lei? With my you're muted. Yeah, I would agree yeah, with you, Andy. Mean, is, is there a little uh, echo? No, uh, we hear you. Echo. We hear you fine. Oh, perfect. Yeah. No. Before um, our Basel, there were definitely smaller fairs that focused more on, let's say, antiques, um, much more traditional arts. Uh, but I think with the start of yeah, Art Hong Kong, which um, eventually became Art Basel Hong Kong as we know it, um, that really, it had a kind of snowball effect. There were a lot of small regional fairs, I would say, like Kiaf. Even before Art Stage Singapore, there was a thing called Art it's called Art Singapore. Art Singapore, yes, yes. that's correct. Yes. We, yes. That read for 10 years, correct. Yeah. So, yeah. So it is, I mean, we came a long, a long way, but short. I mean, I do think the development of art fairs and interest from the public and, and collectors and buyers alike, I think it really grew in a very um, speedy manner. And also the breadth of uh, interest that these collectors have developed over the last decade or 15 years really kind of became much more expansive than we had expanded than, than we had actually imagined, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, and maybe I'll use this as a transition over to Elaine. Um, I remember uh, being told uh, that by someone who lived in Hong Kong for a long time, that before the art fairs came, when people wanted to show their kids sort of large scale exhibitions, they would bring them to auction previews, which is sort of crazy now when you think about how many great galleries with amazing spaces in Hong Kong now, then this is obviously, this is a, a very transformative period. So um, I'm gonna go over to Elaine, who's the editor and she editor and publisher of Art Asia Pacific, which is more than a quarter century old, focused um, as its name would suggest, on works from Asia, the Pacific and the Middle East, you know, the broadest notion possible of, of Asia. Um, she previously to, to Art Asia Pacific worked at Han Art, TZ Gallery, one of the legendary spaces um, and later managed Videotage, uh, which is an, a nonprofit focused as the name suggests again, on video and the moving image. Um, in addition to, you know, running one of the most prominent magazines in the entire continent, Elaine has also set a number of advisory boards such as Asia Art Archive, um, and lectures regularly on Asian modern and contemporary art. Um, Elaine, you're a, you're a, you know, you, you've really watched from up close, from the, you know, from the, you know, from the front row, so to speak, first as Art HK came to Hong Kong, and then as, you know, as Art Basel, you know, took, you know, took that and, and ran with it. And I have to say, before I hand the microphone, so to speak, over to you, um, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the amazing foundation that was laid by Magnus Renfrew um, as the as the founding director of Art HK and the and as the director of Art Basel Hong Kong for the first years, um, you know because he had the vision to try, had the ambition to to start a fair which was modeled along the lines of Art Basel, um, you know in terms of trying to be a truly international fair rooted in its region but still trying to attract the highest possible quality of galleries and artworks from all over the globe and I think. Um, uh, you know, you could have played this very differently as a business, but but in fact, what he set was not just a commercial foundation, but also a cultural foundation for what what came to be. Um, and it was amazing. I remember I won't you know go you know even down to little details like how application documents were structured and that kind of thing. When we when we took over Art HK and started to transform it into Art Basel at um, Hong Kong, you know, we found that the job uh, was sort of much more done than we expected because. Magnus and his team had looked so carefully at what we we're trying to do and then not copy pasted by any means, but adapted it for the context of Hong Kong. So on that note, Elaine, um, uh, you were there, you know, you watched this from up close and I'm curious sort of how you, how you lived, um, you know, the, you know, the beginnings of Art HK and then the transition to Art Basel Hong Kong and, and how, what impact you feel that had on the city and on the region in general? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean you know, we, we cannot, we, we have to give so much credit to, there's a strange uh, echo, I don't know what I should do, turn down the volume. So, so We hear you perfectly. 
Okay, perfect. Um, I can hear my voice 15 times. So sorry about that. Oh. We love Zoom. Um, but yeah, we have to give you know enormous credit to Magnus. And it's funny that you say that because um, actually when he was being interviewed by the team, I had come in maybe one hour before, one hour after his interview. So I was really there at the beginning, the, the very, you know, the first minutes of being hired and kind of watched, you know, what he was slowly building. And I think, you know, you know I cannot give enough credit to Magnus for being very, very sensitive, um, not just to Hong Kong, but, you know, what the fair would mean to the region. Um, and, making sure that it wasn't just like uh, the fair was, uh, you know, kind of parachuting in being run by, you know, someone who's British and just bringing in uh, his friends from let's say Europe or the UK. I mean, he very much embedded himself within uh, the local community and went out and visited those respective scenes in Singapore, Indonesia, Japan so on and so forth. Um, and the changes that I saw when Art Hong Kong, uh, you know, first launched, and then of course, everything really uh, took off when Art Basel uh, started to entertain the idea of, you know, uh, partnering with Art Hong, Hong Kong by uh, uh, being, were you a minority or majority stakeholder? I can't remember. We were, we were majority. We, 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 we bought we bought 60 percent and then at first and then the other 40 percent three years later right and then when it became wholly um, art Basel MCH um, so basically art Hong Kong um, it was a very it was very I mean for lack of a better word a very community driven um, people got behind it they wanted to make sure it worked um, not just people in Hong Kong but you know uh, our colleagues in Singapore and Korea and Japan um, and then when, when people saw the success of Art Hong Kong, including Art Basel, I think more and more galleries from the US and Europe uh, started to come and check it out for themselves. And I think, you know, when you became majority stakeholder, I think that kind of stamp of approval really changed everything. And it made um, Art Basel's interest in, in Art Hong Kong basically was signaling to the wider international art world that, you know, Hong Kong and Asia was, you know, a place that needed to be taken very seriously. Um, and so not only were gallery directors and gallery owners coming to check out Hong Kong or Shanghai or Beijing, and then eventually taking part in the fair, um, they started to look into spaces of course, this spurred this whole um, growth in um, Western galleries setting up spaces in Hong Kong, but also other, you know, lucrative cities, you know, Singapore, um, of course, Seoul, and, you know, for instance, like Blum and Po in, in Tokyo. And, um, and the other things, the kind of knock on effect, I would say, in that decade uh, would be uh, museums, this kind of sense of urgency that um, they needed to have specialists on their curatorial teams. Um, and of course, museums uh, beginning to court uh, collectors and patrons to be on their boards in the last decade. And of course, we can't forget the domestic scene. So uh, the last decade, there've been many more opportunities for artists. Um, and uh, there has been a, matur a maturity um, among the galleries, uh, the nonprofits. Um, they're very, as you know, there are only a handful of museums focused on, on contemporary art, excluding places like uh, Japan and Korea. Um, but there's a, there's a real maturity to the art scenes in these respective scenes. Um, and also a maturity in terms of the general public being interested in art. That's what I would say, uh, the kind of, the growth and the evolution of 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 art since you know Art Basel came on Art Basel came on the scene here in Asia and Hong Kong. Yeah, thanks, Elaine, for that perspective. I mean, I think it's 
this is obviously a, a thing where we played an important role, but obviously we were we were just you know one of one, one of part of a larger ecosystem. Then, and obviously the the fact I remember um, when our Basel when our Basel announced that we had taken a majority share in Art H in the art in Asian art fairs, which owned limited, which owned Art HK. Um, there was a lot of of concern and suspicion on the part of the of the Hong Kong team because they didn't know what this was going to mean, and the concern was that we were going to do precisely what you had credited Magnus for not doing, which just kind of parachute in and dump in whatever we were doing in Basel, you know, into, into Hong Kong. And I think what was interesting, just parenthetically, is that when we studied what had made Basel and Miami successful, we realized that both fairs organically fit, had 50% galleries from their region, in the case of Miami from the Americas, in the case of Basel from Europe. And we actually set out as a requirement that we would try to have at least 50% of the galleries be present, be active in the region. Um, and, it was, and that was, I think, a very important thing that we didn't just take the biggest name international galleries, but we really, and what was surprising, and Emmy remembers this very well, because she was the one fielding angry phone calls from gallerists who didn't get in, was that there were a lot of galleries who got in to Basel or Miami regularly and didn't get into Bar Basel, Hong Kong, because we said, no, it's important that we have enough space for Asian galleries and that even if they're not as well known or not as financially powerful, it's present, it's important that, that we give them that room to grow, that we have a fertile ground and that also that their collectors come to the fair. Um, and I think that brings me to an interesting point. That's my first question to the, to the entire panel, um, which is, it's my impression, and I say this obviously as an outsider, as someone who, who wasn't there much before and has spent some time but not a lot of time in Asia, that at the when we arrived in Asia, meaning 10 years ago, um, a lot of the Asian scenes weren't that well connected to each other. You had kind of pockets like Japan and Korea were in contact with each other and the broader Chinese language scene, you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, mainland China was connected to each other. And of course, Southeast Asia, but there, there wasn't that there, you know, we thought in our mind, we're building a bridge from East to West. But in fact, as I perceived it, you know, and again, tell me if I'm wrong, as I perceived it, there were also a lot of bridges being built within the region as a result of the fair and other dynamics going on. Um, maybe I'll ask, you know, Emmy, do you want to take a first shot at that question? Sort of how did you see that? How did you see that, that those interconnections happening? Yes, I mean, I, I agree with you. Definitely, Apostle Hong Kong created a platform and space for all the professional colleagues to connect. Um, very easily because we were coming from all parts of Asia, larger Asia, including Southeast Asia, uh, to down to Australasia as well. I mean, Australia and New Zealand, right? We, we should not forget those guys there. Um, I mean, you know, I really see uh, Basel to be, uh, to have created a marketplace, which is a very important part of the ecosystem. And because of this marketplace that was created or the opportunities for marketplace growth, that all the other elements in the ecosystem were starting to fall in place. Or if, if they were, it was becoming more formalized, I think, or it really propelled us to work faster or quicker and to adapt to the situation. So, yeah, I think it, I mean, the, the effect of our Basel Hong Kong being in our part of the world also elevated um, the interest from the West uh, to what is in Asia. So I think that expectation, I mean, I, I don't know how you felt, but I'm sure you had a lot of trepidation going into having our Basel Hong Kong opening because the whole I mean, if I can say whole community, international community of the art world had a great expectations from Basel, whether you can deliver, right? What they're used to. And I do think that we kind of were able to do that. I, I, I think we, we, we were, I don't know that, I think fear is the wrong word. I think, um, and I've always encouraged people, you know, I've always said you should never take a job that doesn't scare you. Um, and so in that sense, yes, it was a challenge, but I think, um, I think there were two things. Uh, one is, is we knew that because our galleries were from the West were pushing us that they wanted to come to Asia. So we had the sense that a lot of galleries were just waiting for the right partner to come to Asia, you know, 
Um, but the other thing is that, that, yeah, we knew the expectations were high, that people had a notion of what an art Basel fair was. And I remember we announced that we had purchased a majority ownership in the, in the Art HK just before the fair in 2011. So I came there, I saw the fair first in 2010, less than a year later, we had, we had announced this, this, this acquisition. Um, and some people were surprised that we didn't just slap our logo all over the fair a week after doing the deal. Um, many people were surprised, especially in Asia, because Asia is a fast moving continent in general. We're very surprised that we didn't put our logo and our name on the fair the second year. Because if you may remember in 2012, it wasn't Art Basel Hong Kong already. It was, it was Art HK, I think, produced in collaboration with Art Basel. So we didn't fully put our brand on it because we knew, we felt it would take a year to, to use the term that Tim Etchell is one of the, one of the, the, the founding owners of, of Art HK, said to Baselize Art HK. You know, that we, we knew there was this expectation, you know, and we knew that we would have to have a strong talks program. We knew we would have to get a lot of VIPs moving to the fair. We knew we would have to do a great architecture and a great VIP lounge and a great program in general. And so, yeah. There was a concern, but it was just a, a very interesting challenge. I I'm, I'm, want to go back to the question that sparked that, Emmy, um, and, and pose it to Elaine and to Taka, which is, did you also see this effect um, within the region of there being more interconnectedness? You know, Taka, I'll start with you. You know, I think of Japan and Korea, although these countries have a complicated history, as having a very... A, 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 a cultural scene which is very much in rapport with each other. But did you also see more interest or more connections with the broader Asian scene over the last 10 years? Yeah, I think so. Um, there are lots of uh, Japanese and Korean and, and Chinese collectors. It's all coming to uh, us by the Hong Kong. And we, you know, party party together and and going to, we invite uh, uh, lots of uh, collectors from Hong Kong and Korea and China, and they get them together and talk about, you know, art. And, yeah. you know, it's very connected in, we are in Hong Kong. And especially in Japanese collector, uh, like it became a trend to be become a VIP card holders in by works in the fair uh, with the gallery in between, in, inviting the client and whining and dining and mm -hmm. night after night. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Amazingly, I think uh, almost 200 Japanese collector uh, participated last year, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have to say that Japan, when we launched, Japan and India were two of the countries where we really struggled to get a significant number of collectors to come. Elaine, I'm going to toss the question over to you. Um, and of course, you I mean, the nature of your magazine is that you've always thought in terms of the broader Asian context. But did you start to see, not, not even just at the commercial level, but also the cultural level, more interactions between these different I mean, I say subregions, but these sub many of these subregions are the size of Europe. But like between these different regions of Asia, I would say that um, in the last decade there has been more sense of camaraderie versus maybe less regionalism, even though regionalism still exists. And I think what you you know you um, have observed about kind of. Uh, art scenes being more aligned between, let's say, Korea and Japan is like, this is like, once again, like these regions, East Asia, Southeast Asia, right, we kind of lump them together. And of course, because of proximity, um, there is a kind of natural kind of exchange of information and collaboration. But I would say, yeah, during uh, the last decade, um, when Art Basel came on the scene, there has been like a greater sense of camaraderie, I would say, within the entire region. And I think you know, if I could give credit to Adelaine Oi also because, and, and your amazing VIP team, um, you know, going around and, and, and doing events, having dinners, um, I don't think in any way to encroach on anybody else's scene or territory, but just to say like, you know, we're a part of a community, let's have a dinner together, right? Let's get together and, 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 and have a dinner in Tokyo and then 
you know, maybe do a drinks in, in Singapore during Singapore Art Week. And I think um, because of like what Taka also was talking about, this kind of VIP community, I mean, the, the VIP team and, and then like, and, and their networks of people and bringing them all together. And then the VIPs love kind of meeting each other and exchanging information and visiting each other and going to see exhibitions. I would say that definitely I've seen um, an increase in, in, in kind of like this, not just the home spirit of let's say Hong Kong or Tokyo, but like, yeah, we're part of something larger, right? Um, would you agree on that, Emmy? Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, yes, VIP is one part, but I do think that just as a uh, visitor to Art Basel Hong Kong going from Singapore because the proximity of our two yeah. cities are close enough to make a weekend trip. Um, a lot of young people also made a point to go there. And and I do think that there was larger community beyond VIPs that really addresses address the the satisfaction of going going to see some of the art. Oh, of artworks, course, like the millennials not... that love to travel <laughs> yeah. and be seen in all these different right. places, of course. Yeah. But, they, but they always wanted to see probably, you know, really in person the works of Jeff Koons or or a cause uh, coming from the West or even the works by Ai, Wai, Ai Weiwei of the, some of these big names, but also to go into the discovery section to, to, to see some of the young artists who, who could be friends of a friends of a friend. So, I mean, I do think that this Art Basel really provided a great platform for everybody to kind of come together for one week. Yes. From and, different and, and parts of And make those connections. The, exactly, and, yes. And collaborate, yeah. Yes. I mean, it was a great, I mean, even as a gallerist, I mean, for me to meet artists, for example, who may be in Hong Kong, that was also a very, very good thing for, for, yes. for SDPI as well. I mean, I think this, this, oh, sorry. I was I just going to say, point, true, there are, sorry, sorry, Mark. After you. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say after, I mean, there are, it's true, there are a lot of artists that fly in to, you know, for the big, you know, party and networking and all the exhibitions that take place yeah. during our Basel Hong Kong. I mean, I think this is one of the important dimensions of, of any great international fair, not just our own nowadays, is that it's not just a sales platform. It's also a platform, especially in this region, um, which is so vast and so complex, where a lot of people came. I mean, our, our, you know, to learn, to meet each other, to, to explore what was going on in other parts of Asia and other parts of the world. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, the talks programs in, in our shows in Hong Kong have always been incredibly dense and incredibly well attended, you know, and I think um, it speaks to, you know, it's, it speaks to the need that there is in this region to, get, to, to gather information, to meet people in person, um, because the region isn't as tight or as homogenous, frankly, as Europe is, for example. Um, I have a couple of questions more for the panel. Um, we're starting to have a few questions for the audience, but if you have questions, uh, we only have about 20 minutes left. If you have questions that you want to ask our three panelists or me or all four of us, um, put them into the chat at the bottom because I'll get to you in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the things I think has been really interesting, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, has been that this has also been a period in which major historical movements within Asia became incredibly popular and, and you know, m became market, you know, real market phenomena um, at the broadest global level. You know, I, three, I think the three most prominent are, are the Japanese movements, Gutai and Monoha, and then the, the Korean Dansaikwa movement. Um, you know, all of which were movements from the 60s, 70s, uh, which suddenly rivaled in terms of their, their appreciation and their prices, movements like Alte Povera, you know, um, or abstract expressionism from the same periods and often were shown together. And suddenly these Asian artists were viewed as peers of the people with whom they'd been working at the same time as, but never with the same kind of attention. You know, and I'm curious, maybe Taka, I'll, I'll start with you, although these are not, these are not artists, these are, this is not a, something that's super present in your program, but obviously you, you've watched it, you know? Um, and I'm curious, you know, if you yes. were, if you were in Japan watching Gutai Monoha suddenly take off as global phenomenon. How did you how did you experience that as as an Asian as a member of the Asian art scene? Yes, yeah, I think in 
2013, Alexander Monro curated the Gutai uh, show called Splendid Spirit at the Guggenheim mm -hmm. uh, Museum. And naturally, the artists feature in the show as well, their contemporaries receive increased global attention. And since then, uh, many art world professional hubs started to visit in Japan for research. And they came to us also. And a lot of curator came to study. And why the, uh, those artists not received attention before? I think the reason are uh, many, but one fact, uh, one fact is the uh, relative absence of English translation of Japanese documents. Uh, Kutai, of course, uh, has published its own journal in both Japanese and English, and sending them to overseas as uh, art world professional. So it was uh, recognizing the West in real time. And in the 90s, when I was in visiting New York, I had a chance to see the uh, Japanese art after 1945. Uh, the title called Scream Against in the Sky Exhibition. I find it very interesting because in Japan at the time, it was rare to see such a shows in focus on post-war Japanese art. Uh, many good artists were featured in the show. At the time, the show made the uh, cover of Russia and some other uh, magazines, but I don't think lead immediately to the market sales. Yeah, I mean, I would also say, and maybe this is my prejudice as someone who works very closely with galleries, that I think the Japanese galleries that were working with these artists at the time were not pushing them internationally, you know, that it was, it was only when some of the international galleries um, who had that kind of, you know, that kind of ambition got involved that it really became a global phenomenon. Is that a, a fair or an unfair analysis, Taka? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. My, 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 I, was, I was saying that I think one of the issues as well with Guta, Guta and Monaha when, they were, when it was being produced mm -hmm. is that the Japanese galleries that were working with them also weren't pushing them internationally. They weren't making kind of alliances with other galleries and the kinds of things that people do nowadays to try to bring their artists to a global scale. Yeah, that time I think they don't, uh, there's no fairs, of course. And also, right. you know, galleries is not so much connected to other uh, international uh, galleries. Mm -hmm. and some, are, some, are, some of them are, but only few, maybe one yeah. or two. They only, yeah. I think that time only two or three uh, contemporary art gallery exists in Tokyo. Yeah. So, yeah, what you didn't have, for example, and I'm thinking one of your artists, what you didn't have at the time was this idea that you have kind of um, like an, art, an artist, like my friend Doug Aitken, where you have like, you're representing him in Japan and Sean Regan is representing him in, on the West Coast and Ava Presenhuber is representing him in Zurich. And so there's, he's around in the global market, you know, um, and you didn't have that for those artists. Elaine, I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, how you saw this sudden, you know, this sudden prominence and this sudden, uh, you know, fever pitch surrounding these three movements, um, you know, coming, you know, in, in the last five or 10 years. I think this is, you know, largely to do with these museum shows um, and, um, Alan Schwartzman, for instance, advising his clients, um, buying a lot of the um, uh, Gutai and Monoha artists. I mean, obviously, observing that there were, you know, imp important historical art movements taking place, like they are all over the world, not just in in Europe and and the U.S. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that this has. I mean, of course, the market is is a very powerful machine, uh, which brings visibility, um, you know, and and the kind of conversation around price. But you know, these art these artists and these art movements existed. I mean, the question is like because 
a museum like Alexandra Monroe, who has done incredible things for uh, Japanese art, particularly Japanese post-war art. Um, there's a show in New York, does that mean it's validated, right? I mean, these, these artists and these movements were still important in Japan. Um, and, and for people who knew them, I'm particularly Gutai in, in, in Europe, they were still, you know, many of these artists were respected and, and, and influential. Um, but I mean, it, it, there are still so many other artists that, you know, museums in Europe and, and, and in the US don't know about, but we may know about them here in Asia, right? So yeah. um, uh, not just Dan Sequa and Gutai Monoha, they're, you know, significant artists happening in Indonesia, people like FX Harsana, who's so important um, in, 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 in Beijing, for instance, the No Name Group, um, Hong Kong, you know, artists that were very important in the mid 20th century, Louis Chan, um, of course, the Philippines, so many great modern artists, Artur Lutz, conceptual artists like Roberto Chabet. Um, and I guess the only thing I would say about that, I also think it was a period in which the, the art market became very conservative. And so they were looking at these kind of, these, these artists that were part of the historical canon. So what happened then, I, I feel like with this kind of discovery of, of, of Gutai and Monoha is that artists, the younger artists, the mid-career artists and the younger artists um, became kind of overlooked. And I still think there's, we're still experiencing a kind of a backlash against, you know, pre-2008 against, you know, uh, when everybody was kind of, you know, totally interested in younger artists, uh, much more supportive. Now everybody was like gravitating only to Dan Sequa artists or Gutai artists or Monoha. And I think there's, you know, still a lot of room for um, looking at artists beyond these kind of three very fashionable art movements. Okay. Elaine, that's a, that's a perfect transition to my next question, which I'll pose to Emmy. So Emmy, you can start warming up. Um, and then I'll go to audience questions from the audience. Um, I mean, every director puts their, as much as Art Basel is, you know, an organization with a history and a legacy, and I, I think a, a pretty strong DNA, I think every director puts their stamp on the shows. And I think, um, Elaine, you very rightly pointed out that Magnus's sensitivity to the fact that he was an Englishman in Asia launching a fair with an international dimension that was owned by two other Englishmen, three other Englishmen, um, was incredibly important and I think was essential. You know, at the same time, uh, when he was succeeded by Adeline Oye, um, she also brought her whole history as, as an, you know, as a curator, as an art history person, uh, you know, student, as a writer, et cetera, et cetera, into the fair. And I think one of the interesting, really interesting things is the extent to which, um, especially with the insight section, um, the exactly the other, all those other historical movements within Asia were mined, you know, and were brought forward. And I'm curious, Emmy, as someone who was very actively involved, and I think um, I rarely, I, I very, I, 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 I very rarely tell stories out of the committee rooms because it's confidential. Um, and this one isn't specific enough that it's a, a real betrayal of trust in any way, but like, I remember in the old days, I mean, that we would have to literally go through when we were doing the insight sector and be like, okay, this is an important gallery. Um, which of their artists can we stomach having in the fair? Like this, this is not important. This is a, this is a gallery we want in the fair. Like which three artists were, or should we tell them to take for insights? And we were almost curating the sector in the beginning. And then I think as galleries strengthened and as they realized that there was an interest in historical material, um, we just basically had to choose which projects not to take, not kind of curate the booths. And I think that was a real shift. And I'm curious, Emmy, when you look at the development of this, of, of sort of the, the rising confidence, the rise, the change in which these, you know, the, the market, you know, the, the periods which were Dante called Guitar Monoha, which everybody knew, but there were people were putting things forward. How do you see that evolution? Because obviously you're someone who, who deals at a very global level. And I'm curious how you saw that evolution in the, in the interest in the more historical, less market um, driven movements. Well, 
I would actually, or the other way around, it was more like, oh, we don't know about this gallery. We've never heard of this gallery. But then the artist is really important to our region, for example. Right. I remember one, one very specific example was Lee Wen, who um, late Lee Wen, who passed away last year. Um, he was very, very important part of um, our region, coming out from region as a performance artist. And um, the committee members are comprised of not only Asians, but we do have Western colleagues. So I thought, you know, these whole process, whenever we went through the inside sector, it was really, uh, it became a very interesting and learning um, time for our Western colleagues in the selection committee and they really appreciate this. So going back to your question, I in the beginning, yes, we 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 had to kind of work with galleries. Um, you know, some of us will take a few galleries each and talk with them. And it was really basically about how can we help them or guide them to curate a booth because art fair was not something that they did day in, day out, right? And it is very different from the gallery, having a gallery show. So, but I remember, Mark, we also said after a couple of years and we said, well, we don't have to do that anymore. I mean, the, the, the pace in which the galleries learn how to really present the artists that they want to present to the public after one or two times, as you said, the fast learning curve, I mean, you know, the galleries in our, our region learned really fast and it was almost like, okay, so they're now on their own. So, you know, this whole process of working with galleries and I think that was really something that we cannot buy with and this whole growth growth process that we went through with selection committees with the man with you guys and the galleries themselves coming into the, the fair it's it was really priceless and i mean they they worked really hard because they also understood the expectations uh of from the fair organization but as well as the public so we we all came together to work to, together to put out the best show possible every year and the 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 growth level has been increasing year by year strengthened really yeah thank you i mean we have a few a few questions we have a few minutes and a few questions so i'm going to take those from the audience um let me see what we have. Yes, one, I mean, there are, as I said before, many major regions, cultural regions within, um, within the, the Asian art world. Uh, and we have three of them very well represented here in the sense of, um, you know, the, the area, the Chinese language area, the Japan, Korea, North in the North and then Southeast Asia. But what we don't have here is India or um, or Australia and New Zealand. And I, I, Elaine, since you're the one, you know, who specialized in the entire region, um, you know, if people are, are curious uh, about how those regions are, how they relate to the rest of the region, and how they've evolved in the last 10 years, would you mind taking sort of a freestyle, spontaneous shot at trying to, at, at explaining how they fit into this broader jigsaw puzzle of the Asian cultural scene? I think, uh... In terms of India, um, South Asia, I mean, South Asia, don't get me wrong, it's not just India, but Pakistan. Sorry, Shizan, the question was asked yeah. about India, but yes, obviously the whole region, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, I, I, if, you, if we were to go back, and I know we don't want to talk about auctions, but even the way auctions approach you know, Asian art, you know, they also, they, they'll have sales of, of, of Chinese works of art, and Japanese works of art. And they also include things from South Asia, um, objects from South Asia. And, and in terms of uh, contemporary art, I think there is a lot of uh, connections and dialogues happening. And, and they were happening even you know, before, well before the art market with places like Code, right? Uh, this nonprofit art space that uh, the artists run space, um, very supportive of experimental practices. They often invited artists from the region to take place, um, uh, to take part in those residencies. Um, and uh, I think that even though uh, in, in your fair, for instance, you do have a number of galleries from South Asia that are taking part. Um, 
I think that there still could be stronger connections and dialogues happening. But I would say in a place like Hong Kong, which is very international and, and also Singapore, which has a very huge South Asian community, I do think um, there is um, interest among collectors and, and, and gallerists and in terms of looking at art from South Asia and a kind of exchange between, you know, South, A South Asian collectors looking at Chinese art and vice versa. I mean, one of the, um, one of the most important collectors of Indian modern art is actually from Japan. Uh, you probably know him, Taka. You know this, who I'm talking about, Masanori, Masanori-san? Oh yes, sure, of course. Yeah, yes. yeah. So I think that there are, there is a kind of conversation and connections and there is uh, a kind of, there is an exchange in terms of the art market. I don't think it's as um, strong in terms of what's happening within Southeast Asia and East Asia, uh, particularly in Hong Kong. And I think you can see the same thing happening within the, the auction market. Um, for a while, Sotheby's and Christie's were putting contemporary Indian art in their sales but they, have, they haven't been doing that as actively. And I think that that also is, a, uh, I think, a repercussion of what happened in 2008 in terms of those collectors. They were so enthusiastic at, at one point, and, and I don't know to what degree the Indian art market has since recovered since, since 2008, yeah. but I, I think it's important. Um, yeah. in, terms of, in terms of Australia, I think there's a long history there of, of Australia aligning itself uh, with Asia, particularly through the Queensland Art Gallery and the Asia Pacific Triennial. Um, and, you know, uh, museums in Australia having uh, some of the earliest and most extensive collections of Asian contemporary art. And a lot of Australian galleries um, showing artists from, from this part of the world, like, uh, well, it's no longer in existence, but the Sherman, uh, Sherman galleries showing artists like uh, Li Ming Wei, for instance, a really important uh, relational aesthetic uh, artist from from Taiwan, right? So yeah. that's that's yeah. That's the quick. That's the thumbnail sketch. I mean, I mean, uh, I think these are both regions, both both Australia, New Zealand, and or Oceania, whatever you want to call it, and South Asia. Um, that have strong relationships with Singapore. How do you, do you, do you want to add anything on to what Elaine said as well? I, well, I mean, as Elaine said, Singapore, both Singapore and Hong Kong, both cities really have quite a large community from South um, Asia. And I do think that in Art Basel, Hong Kong, there may not be a lot of gallery representation, but there are there are artists from this part of the world that are represented, I think, um, not necessarily with the galleries from this region. Uh, South Asia is such a large region and with, even within the region, there's so much diversity. So it would be good for us to, to see more of it. It's just that how to, how do we integrate and be, make, um, the platform for 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 us to see all the things that we would like to showcase. I mean, that is kind of another story. But um, yeah, I would I I do think that there is an opportunity that we can definitely create to to showcase more of this um, the works coming from there, and that would benefit us. Yeah. Emmy Emmy, speaking of works, um, several people in the chat have asked. What are the works behind you? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> this was my us. very, very first art purchase. That's that's the wow. woodcut. It's a woodcut triptych of Sol Lewitt. Yeah. You started right at the top, huh? And then I paid in installments. <laughs> I couldn't right. afford it to pay all that's at once. Great. That's a great story. Um, Thank you, Ami. We're officially out of time, so to speak. Um, I want to thank uh, Elaine and Emmy and Taka for, for giving these, these very personal perspectives from different parts of the world or from different parts of the region. Um, this is also, as I said at the beginning, this is the last of the five 
panels that we did exploring the 50 year history of our Basel. It's also the last panel of the year. Um, and I have to say, you know, this has been an unparalleled and in many ways, you know, disastrously challenging year for our Basel. If, if you had told me a year ago that we would celebrate our 50th anniversary by not doing any shows, um, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, and I have to say that these Zoom panels um, for a lot of people have been something that's been really essential. I think for us in terms of staying in touch with, with all the different kinds of stakeholders from all over the world, but I think especially in the darkest days of the lockdown, you know, to see faces, to hear voices from other parts, to hear how people were dealing with things, to hear different opinions, to get that kind of input that normally we get face to face at the fairs has been essential. And I think it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be the host of so many of these panels um, and to talk with so many of my peers, friends, colleagues from all over the world. And, and you know, the fact that hundreds of people, if not thousands of people have shown up all the time, so to speak, so to speak, um, to watch these. So again, I wanna thank our panelists and I wanna thank our audiences for showing up. And I wanna thank the team from Art Basel that, you know, that created, you know, made these things happen. Um, as I always say, it takes a lot of work to make things look effortless. And uh, so the team has been able to, to really help make these as smooth as possible, you know, learning on the run. Um, and on that note, uh, I have for all the thanks, I wanna wish you, everybody watching uh, a great, let's say a great weekend, because we're almost there. Happy holidays mm -hmm. and a very smooth slide into 2001. May that be the year in which art reunites us again. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. See you in person. <laughs>